Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me along. It's a bit of a challenge here with such a great view and everyone. Yeah. So I'll try and keep it interesting and, and, uh, and to the point. Also, it's interesting comparing sort of what we're doing with um, the, the prior presentation and how hard it must be as investors and advisors to actually really have such a broad understanding of so many different projects and, and, um, and compare and contrast them. So I'll try and keep it on topic and maybe uh, educate a little bit uh, and, um, and hopefully you go away knowing a little bit more than when you started. I just really, there's, there's three key parts to, to what I'd like to speak about. One is the people. I suppose with my background really about building companies and starting companies, I'm quite passionate about the, the, the fact that no matter how good a project is, without a great team to execute it, it won't work. So I, I think that people really do need to be the, the central part in any strategy and any plan. Also, because we're in tin and tungsten, and most particularly tin, I need to talk about the commodity itself. Um, fundamentally, tin, I think, has a, has a history that, that is not uh, in, in step with, with the future which tin has. And then lastly, which is a bit back to front probably for a commodity presentation, is to talk about the project. And then just a little bit about our plans and, and then wrap it up. So the company as it stands now, uh, we are not a micro cap, we're a nano cap. <laughs> um, um, so basically, Elementos acquired uh, another company. So we've just merged with, with a company called Rockwell to, to take on board the, um, the tin and tungsten assets in Tasmania. So post-merger, we've done a, a capital raising. So we've just complete, completed about a, a $1.6 million capital raising. So we have cash. We've got a market cap of about $10.9 million. So we, we, are, we are tiny, um, <laughs> but we, we, we have some um, good plans and I think we have some good assets which uh, are quite interesting. So, to talk a little bit about our strategy and people. From a strategy point of, point of view, as I said, you know, I'm quite passionate about, uh, about people and the need to invest in great people. Um, from the project perspective, what was liked about Elementos, and I think the, the former board of Elementos need to be credited, that we're probably one of the first of, of many companies that had to realise that the, the markets changed. Um, Elementos had uh, gold and, and copper assets uh, in Australia and South America, but the ability to continue funding and doing exploration on those assets was clearly um, coming to an end. So the board moved probably 12 months ago to, to put in place a strategy to find an asset which was further down the development path um, that, that met a whole bunch of criteria. Um, I'm quite glad to say that uh, that selection criteria actually included um, Rockwell, which I was uh, executive chairman of, and included the, the Cleveland assets. So that, what is differentiated about the project? Well, really about focusing on, on reduced capex and, and low opex, and projects that actually minimise the pre-revenue expenditure. What we're seeing a lot of is, is good projects that uh, have net present values of 100 to 200 million dollars, but they have a, a capital requirement of 100 million dollars. And if you've got a very small uh, market capitalization, actually funding those in the current market is difficult. So you need to have a, an innovative way that you can actually develop these projects. And, and in line with that, I think that a lot of that capability obviously comes from within the company. So building a capability in a company that can actually deliver, deliver projects on time and on budget. And also we can see as being a nano cap or a tiny little company, we need to have powerful friends. So an a, a organisation that can develop strategic relationships with organisations um, that are bigger and stronger than they are is also quite important. So the basis um, of the team to actually deliver that is, is really coming from the board. So we've, we've got a very lean and mean board, which was quite intentional. Um, so basically myself, uh, from a, a more of a company startup back background, mechanical engineer, MBA. Corey Nolan, who was the, the MD, has stayed on in an executive director role, uh, principally around his skill set with um, uh, business development, joint venturing, strategic relationships, and, uh, and certainly compliments me. Got much stronger background in, in, in finance and, uh, and equity markets. And we've been fortunate enough also to bring Richard Seville into the mix. So Richard Seville is the current uh, managing director of Oracobra, which is one of the few um, companies around at the moment that's taken a, a, a nice project from really um, discovery right through to production, hopefully uh, early next year, with the lithium project in Argentina. Uh, Richard also has a, a, a background in hard rock um, mining in Tasmania, which is also very um, 
um, fortunate with the Cleveland asset. So we were supported by um, um, a couple of senior executives, so basically CFO and, uh, and ge geologist. And then we've, we've stayed, um, kept a strong relationship with the guys that um, were with Rockwell and had done a lot of the early development work. So we've got the basis of a team, um, obviously a long way to go yet, but uh, it, I think it's always important to have a good foundation. So to talk a little bit about tin. So I've talked about the people, now I'll talk about the commodity. Um, tin is always, I, I, I get the impression talking to people all around the world that, that when you talk about tin, it's still connected very much to tin cans, tin roofs, tin soldiers. Very low tech applications, but the fact of the matter is that that tin now is, is being used in very small quantities in a lot of different things, and primarily consumer electronics and automobiles, chemicals, things like that. Um, the beauty of it being used in, in small amounts a lot is that it has uh, fairly inelastic um, demand side characteristics, which is obviously a good thing in commodities. So the actual overall um, tin usage or tin demand uh, looks like 53% actually goes into solder. So this is primarily being driven by consumer electronics. Um, and as the, as the global economy picks up, we see a pickup in this area. So that's, that's a good start. The tin plate side of things, certainly in developing countries for food packaging and, and um, oil packaging, food oil packaging and things like that, is still a, a major part of the business. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's not the critical bit. So overall, you could say, about 75% of tin now goes into what I would consider to be high-tech applications, whether it be chemicals or, or consumer electronics and things like that. So that makes it an interesting demand side characteristic. On the supply side, um, basically we, we have the situation where tin has traditionally come from alluvial sources, so it's been um, uh, quite easy when the price went up for extra supply to come into the market. What we're seeing in Indonesia is a decline in output and we've seen Malaysia used to be a big, uh, a big producer of tin, but once the alluvial sources ran out, it very quickly became basically a, a negligible supplier of tin to the world markets. Um, so, so the fact that Indonesia is starting to see a decline in output would suggest that, that as a, you know, a long-term prospect, the alluvial supplies out of Indonesia are probably dis decreasing. On top of that, the largest um, tin mine in the world is a, is a tin mine called San Rafael in Peru. This mine is a hard rock mine, um, has produced up to 10% of the global supply. The company that, that, that owns it, Minsa, has actually come out and said that by um, 2018, they'll be out of resource. So there's 10% of supply just there. So those two issues in concert with each other really do put the supply side um, in, in an interesting state. So we've got a very sub stable demand side and the supply side is looking stretched. So it's a commodity space we like the look of. So over um, the last five years, six years, you can basically see that there's been a general uptrend in, in the price of tin. Um, it, it's, it's the favoured long position with metals traders in, in uh, London at the moment. Uh, and we would expect, and we're bullish on tin obviously, but we would expect the price of tin to continue um, to, to 30,000 and then, then somewhere north of that. And global um, supply is on the, uh, demand is on the increase, so it's, it's an interesting scenario. So the Cleveland project is actually a brownfields um, mine in Tasmania. It was owned and operated by Aberfoyle. Uh, it, was, it was closed down at, in about uh, 1984 on the back of a, a, pro a collapse in the tin price. So basically tin was uh, the price of supply and demand of tin was primarily controlled by a cartel. Um, the cartel collapsed and the price of tin collapsed along with it. So a lot of tin mines closed down at that stage and a lot of um, cheap supply came out of places like Brazil, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. So it's taken really 30 years for, for that um, process to, to shake through. And in that intervening 30 years there's been very little um, development or, or exploration in tin. So the actual location of, of the mine site is quite close to Burnie in northwest Tasmania. It's, it's a proven tin province. Um, the, the largest operating tin mine in Australia is very, very close and it's Renison Mine. Um, it's a mine that's been operating continuously for about 60 years. Um, it's got large supplies in front of it. it, it it's a resource that uh, has similarities to, to the Cleveland resource. Um, other, operating, uh, other mines that have operated in the area um, were Bischoff and obviously Cleveland itself. 
Tasmania actually, probably contrary to, to popular belief, is also a very pro-mining jurisdiction. There's, there's, a, uh, you know, there's a lot of support for good projects in, in Tasmania and we've, um, we've found the, the MRT and the EPA in Tasmania very, very, very good to deal with. From an infrastructure point of view, which obviously is, is quite critical from bringing a mine back into, um, into production, we've got an export port which is 90 kilometres away by road. Um, we have paved roads up to the mill, um, to the mine entrance, uh, access to good labour, um, and and also skilled and, and knowledgeable labour. There's um, transmission power lines that actually pass through the site, so power is not a problem. And there's abundant water on site as well. So so fundamentally, we we have all the elements that we need. We also have pulled together a strategic tenement holding. Um, we've got about 100 square kilometres of land um, centred around uh, the EL. 7 2005 uh, site. We, we've, we've pegged some of this land and we acquired some of it really for a strategic sort of position that we didn't want uh, anyone else sort of coming and, and crowding around us. The work that we've done to date actually um, indicates that there is some, some quite prospective things and one of the, the more recent things we've done is um, uh, identified a porphyry tungsten resource sitting below the, the tin uh, and with porphyries obviously that's that's created a bit of interest to see whether there's any other poor freeze coming up in, in the immediate area. So we actually have already got a, a jork resource on, on our asset in Tasmania. So there's about 60,000 tonnes of contained tin, um, which we've already been able to, to identify. And we have about 12,000 tonnes of, um, of tungsten also. So basically we were able to, to, to um, define this resource primarily on the historical information that was available, uh, which was, was a huge cost saving to the organisation. Um, you can see that we've actually taken the data and built up the block model, so it gives you an, an impression of, of, of actually how the resource sits. It's actually um, in, in a hill, so the, the entrance to the, the decline is actually sort of midway um, in the decline shown in red. So we, we went up into the hill and then we go down underneath the hill, obviously. Um, the resource is, is open at depth and also a long strike. Interestingly, the, the mineralisation um, probably comes from the granite, which is at about 4,000 metres in this area. Now, we, we have a lot of, as I was saying, Renison is the operating tin mine, and there's a lot of um, information that we can sort of garner from that. And their mineralisation goes all the way down to the granite. Uh, it's only about... I think a thousand metres in, at Renison. So the opportunity for us to have mineralisation extending at depth is, is, is very real. And also a long strike. We, we know that the, the intersections at the extents of the strikes um, were still quite good. So, so there's, there's certainly upside on, on the resource scope side. We also, in defining the resource, you can see that we actually didn't include any remnant mining. So I think we're, we're, we've um, got a strategy there that does set us apart. It's not about going back in and robbing pillars and sort of trying to, to scrape the last little bit out of a mine. It's actually a fresh resource. So, um, you know, we don't have issues with, um, with, with ground conditions changing because we're trying to, to basically steal the last bit out of it. I mentioned briefly the exploration target that's around the tungsten. So the top of the tungsten resource was drilled sufficiently that we could, um, we could have a, a jork resource just on the, the top bit of the red area. The, um, what, what we've been able to do with, because some of the um, intersections we had, we were actually extrapolate out this, this um, exploration target, so it's a conceptual exploration target. What it did tell us is potentially this is sort of one of the larger um, uh, tungsten resources around, possibly in the top 10 in the world. Um, at reasonable grade and, and amenable to bulk mining methods um, which would allow it to be mined economically. One of, the, one of the big assets that we had and being a brownfield site, we had access to all the drill core. So we have about 130,000 metres of, of drill core that we've um, used to build out the Jork uh, resource. And this um, diagram actually shows how extensively drilled it is. 
We, our, some of our peers have pub said publicly that to, you know, to get their resource to the point that they can actually do a BFS, it's cost up to $30 million, and we've basically um, inherited this for free. So I think it's a big, big differentiator. An interesting point on this diagram is, is the area that's got the, the yellow circle around it, which was the, um, the angle drilling that was done to identify the, the Foley zone, which was the tungsten uh, area. And you can see that the intersections are, are quite, ex you know, quite long and consistent grades, so 177 metres at 0.29 WO3 was, um, was, was a very good indication and that's why we've been able to develop the, uh, the conceptual target for it. One of the other assets that we see that we have is the fact that there is still an existing mine on site. Um, the mine, because it was developed from 69, um, it, it actually has employed a lot of best practice mining design and development techniques that, that are still used today. And the mining rates and, and, and tonnes per hour that were achieved uh, when Cleveland was in, in production have actually stood the test of time. So we're quite confident that, that the infrastructure that's there is, is usable and it's also um, very applicable to mining mi uh, modern mining techniques. So we have a 5 by 5 decline. We have, um, we have ventilation which is appropriate for, for um, diesel powered underground mining equipment. Um, so so the, the cost saving doing a refurbishment of that, uh, of, of that infrastructure as opposed to having to drive it uh, it's probably twofold. Obviously, there's the straight dollar savings, but also it's the timing. Um, it allows us to get into production uh, uh, potentially quicker. The, the ore body at Cleveland also is, is well understood from a um, metallurgy and a mineral processing point of view. So basically, the, the ore is the tin is uh, in the form of cassiterite, which is an oxide mineral, and the copper is in the form of chalcopyrite. So the process uh, that was actually implemented, and that is the basis for our, our redevelopment and our um, upcoming PFS, uh, was simply the mine, the, the ore was mined, it was u uh, mined using very low cost sort of sub-level um, uh, caving type operations, so very open stopes, very cheap, great ground conditions. The ore was brought to the surface where it was crushed. Uh, it then went through a heavy media separation, which allowed about 40% of the material to be rejected whilst only losing 10% of, um, of, of, the, of the metal. So, the, so basically it's a high grading step that means the milling and the further processing is, is much reduced. Um, from there, milled sulphide flotation, which uh, recovers the, the copper for the copper concentrate, then went through an oxide, um, a gravity circuit rather, to recover gravity recoverable cassiterite, and then uh, a tin flotation uh, at the end to recover any remaining um, uh, tin. So a very straightforward process and, and the basis of which we'll go forward on. So just, so what is our plan? So fundamentally, with the money that we've just raised, um, we've got sufficient cash flow to go through two really key steps. One is the, the first stage environmental approvals, um, which we would ex we've got a deadline to submit to the EPA in Tasmania by um, the 12th of December this year. Um, we did some, we expect to get an answer back on, on that uh, in the first half of next year. In parallel with that, we've um, engaged Mining One and Pitt and Sherry to complete a, a PFS for us, uh, which we'd also expect to get back in the first half of next year. So fundamentally, we're, we're now, I suppose, um, putting the, the economics and, and de-risking the project. Um, so, Broadly speaking, um, the, the, the steps are, you know, this year is pretty much done. Um, we will have a, a, um, a resource upgrade possibly before Christmas. Uh, and then next year is a very busy time in basically getting the PFS done, um, working on our offtake agreements, permitting, so on and so forth. Um, and potentially uh, project financing in, in 2015. So in conclusion, well, I think um, all my peers say the same thing, and I suppose every micro cap, nano cap in Australia is saying the same thing in the mineral space and that we're undervalued. We just seem to be a little bit more undervalued than our peers, but <laughs> um, I'll, I'll leave that to you to assess. So the conclusion is really, you know, from a, from a company point of view, I think that, uh, you know, we've got, a, we've got a great team. I think we've got a, a clear strategy. 
and we are trading at, at, a, at a pretty um, at a pretty significant discount to our peers and we are a commodity play you know if you like tin I think that um, we give good exposure to tin in a, in a fairly de-risk format as I talked about uh, the commodities I think that tin and tungsten are both exciting uh, they've both got interesting and attractive uh, supply and demand dynamics our project and it is very important I think it's in the right location it's, it's environmentally supported, which I think uh, is, is a big risk factor. We've got an existing decline, we've got an extensive, extensively drilled, and we've got a few development options. And we're exploring those development options in the PFS, so um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to come out with a, with a PFS that actually demonstrates how we can uh, minimise capital to the point that the, at the hurdles aren't unachievable. So I suppose we've got a clear focus on that, um, you know, uh, hurdle capital as we go into the whole PFS stage. We're trying to design the smarts in up front rather than you know, coming out with a PFS that we don't like the look of and then having to try and tweak it later on. Um, on the upside, we've got a, a potentially very large scale tungsten resource. We've got uh, good, good, good ground for exploration. And uh, we also have a, a portfolio of, of assets in, in South America and Queensland still. So from a broker perspective, um, I, I think the key point on this, so we, we actually had an analyst have a look at it and, and, and got a fairly positive response. But the key point I take away from on that slide is that the proven mining and metallurgy and a four kilometre decline in place from a historical operation significantly de-risks the projects and reduces future capex. To make the lawyers happy, <laughs> I will disclaim now everything I've said. <laughs> and, um, and thank you for your time.